Hello and welcome to talk about the global mega trends that will impact India's place in the world in the year 2020. We are joined now at the World Economic Forum in Davos by one of the world's leading public intellectuals and thinkers, Farid Zakaria. Farid, welcome to India today. It's fabulous to have you with us. We've just started a new year. And as one of the world's leading thinkers, I want you to explain to our audience what you think are the key global mega trends that you're looking out for most closely that you believe will impact India's place in the world this year. Well, the most important one, I think, was evident at this Davos. Uh, Davos, I, this is, I think, my 24th Davos. Most years that I've come here, uh, it's all about openness. It's all about opening up markets, opening up technology, widening access, uh, encouraging the flow of ideas, people, goods all over the world. And of course, it is that opening that allowed India to rise after the, the reforms of the early 90s. This Davos, you had the President of the United States explaining how he wanted managed trade, limited immigra uh, immigration, uh, controls on technology, uh, and it was, in, in a sense, part of a larger atmosphere that China, after all, walls off its technology, practices a certain amount of limited free trade. And so we've gone from a very different a mood of openness to a mood of, clo you know, of, of, I wouldn't say all being closed, but managed uh, and limits. Now, if that's the case, that's a very different uh, international economy and global system for India. Uh, unfortunately, Prime Minister Modi has adapted to it very well. Two years ago, Modi came to Davos, and if you watch his speech, it was basically a crit critique of Donald Trump. It was saying too many nations are turning inward, globalization is shrinking, in fact, we need more trade, more openness. Since then, of course, India has become the world champion of protectionism. The U.S. Trade Department pointed out that India now has the large, highest tariff barriers of any country in the world. So uh, it feels to me this is, a very, this is a very dangerous path for India to be on. Look, the United States can, can, can flirt with protectionism. China can flirt with protectionism because they're actually much more open than the Indian economy is. India needs openness. It needs foreign investment. It needs the competition to be able to really be world class. And if India starts closing itself off in a world that's closing itself off, it's not good for India. We're seeing uh, some kind of a fight back from the streets. We've seen students going out and protest. What, are you following that yeah. very closely? What are you making of the anti-CA protest that we've seen? A lot of it in the Muslim community, women out in places like Shaheen Bagh, and also in schools, universities, colleges, and campuses across the country. Look, protests are, are important. They're, they've been an incredibly reassuring sense of India's civic culture, democratic culture. After all, don't forget, Indian independence begins with nonviolent protests, uh, you know, by the, from the Indian National Congress. It, by itself, it, it's not enough. You need organization. You need an opposition uh, party or coalition. Uh, and you need alternative leadership. And those are the things that I think we have to look at. The, be the best thing I have to say in, about India in retrospect, uh, you know, thinking about how the, the, the country is put together, is that the states have retained a lot of autonomy. They've retained their own political culture. And so that, I think, is going to... The reason I'm optimistic about India is I think that at the state level, you are going to see a pushback. You're going to see, uh, you know, a, 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 a kind of... The checks and balances of the American system don't quite exist at the central level in India, but they exist at the state level. Um, and they have always broken this kind of um, quest for absolute power in India. If you think about in the 60s, what broke the hold of Congress first was the South over linguistic uh, issues. It might happen again. The BJP has almost no representation from the South. And so if that becomes a form of the check, Maybe that's good, but it's important that it then be translated into a, progr a programmatic oppositional response that is pro-democratic. You don't want the next group to come in and say, now we get to pack the courts with our judges. Now we get to intimidate the media and withhold advertising, so they'll be pro favorable to us. Th that isn't the right answer. So that's why I say leadership is very important. A culture of democracy, a culture of openness has to be at the heart of this opposition. You said American elites are disappointed, but that doesn't seem to be impacting relations between President Trump and Prime Minister Modi. We had Prime Minister Modi 
at the Howdy Modi event with Donald Trump walking around and that was quite something Donald Trump later saying he hadn't seen something like that. Now we're, uh, we're hearing that Donald Trump will be coming to India next month. So what are you making of the American president's visit to India? How do you think that's likely to go? And the fact that uh, Prime Minister Modi, according to the latest India Today Mood of the Nation poll, still remains hugely popular. We just put that poll out this week. He, his party would still get very close to a majority. Yeah. Look, at a strategic level, as I've always said to you, Rahul, we've talked about this uh, before. U.S. wants India as a partner, as an ally. India has been the reluctant bride. I mean, the Bush administration handed India everything it had asked for in the nuclear deal, and the Indians were suspicious, even this, you know, despite that. So the, the relationship has always been one where India has still not figured out whether it is completely comfortable being in the U.S. orbit. Modi, I think, is more uh, willing, but BJP has its own uh, concerns about foreign domination in industry, economy, culture, in all those areas. So that remains. I think politically, Modi and Trump are natural allies for the reasons we've been talking about. They're both strongmen. They're both populists. They're both, um, they, they both also see this long-term relationship. So I, I do hope that India and America can develop a relationship that is long-term and not based on personalities or parties, but based on the enduring realities of the shared culture, the shared values, and the reality of a geostrategic uh, cl climate in which China has been rising and there is a need for some structure to contain that rise. So I, I think it will all be fine, but I don't think it changes the fact that you don't have, you know, at that broader societal level, societal, uh, societal elites, business elites, intellectual elites are somewhat disappointed with India. You've written of deglobalization. Kumar Mangalam Birla recently writes of slobalization, the era of slobalization. How do you think a country like India, given where we are in the income pyramid, should be pushing its growth numbers at a time when global exports, one of the key pillars of growth, are slowing down and is that much tougher for a country like India to grow, uh, unlike what China was able to achieve over the last three decades? So first of all, it's a good reminder that when you have a chance, take it. India squandered the opportunity of three decades of openness. To, to be fair, didn't squander it. In the 1990s, it took a real advantage of it. But in the last uh, 10 years, I would say, it has squandered an opportunity with them where there was still a great era of progress and openness. But if you are committed to it, there's enough globalization going on for, to, for India to benefit. If you look at countries like Greece, uh, uh, Ukraine, uh, Brazil, they are busy reforming. They are busy... You know, and the truth is, in an, in, an, in an age of slower growth, in an age where it's harder to find stars, if you're one of the, the countries that are truly reforming and opening up, you may, may, you may benefit more. You know, if you came to Davos 10 years ago and you said, my economy is doing well, my finance minister is brilliant, we've done these reforms, they would say, take a, num take a, a ticket and stand in line. There are 25 countries like that. In the next 10 years, maybe there will be only five countries like that. And if India is one of those five, it will be the, by far the largest. Look, India has an extraordinary opportunity because it is the largest uh, developing market in the world that still has potential because of its low base. You know, I mean, India is what? It's under $2,500 GDP. China is close to 10,000, uh, even more now, right? So there is a great opportunity for growth. but. People, as I say, have been disappointed enough that there have to be genuine efforts. And the government, you know, it's not just the government, the Reserve Bank, you get the feeling in India that the people in charge just don't get markets, capitalism, investment. They're constantly, they're two steps forward, four steps back. You spoke of the world looking out for key reforms from India. What are the reforms you believe global investors would like to see to help India move its growth story? Look, it's pretty obvious what India needs to do. The problem is to have the political courage to do it. The financial system is a total mess. You have way too many state-owned companies in India. And they've waited so long, they're basically going to have to give them away. The Air India story is the perfect example. You know, 25 years ago, you could have pr properly privatized it. At this point, if, 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 if there's a fire sale, they'll be lucky. If there are people who are willing to pick up the pieces of debris, they'll be lucky. There are hundreds of companies like that you could do. They need the money. Um, you've got to stop these, uh, th these uh, subsidies that are, not, you know, that are not inefficient. So there's so many areas where there are, there are opportunities for it. GST was meant to be a simplification. 
what do you still have seven levels of you know if, oh, it's maybe down to five now it needs to come down to one or two at the most there's, there's, it's the most complicated sales tax in the world right now so there's so many cases where what needs to be done is obvious the question is do you have the political will to actually do it in the last part of the interview i want to ask you about uh, kashmir and what's your sense of what's happening in Jammu and Kashmir and the government's decision to scrap Article 370, which has led to some problems in Kashmir. But by and large, would you say the government's been able to contain the situation better than most would have expected? Yes, I think that they have been able to contain the situation better than most have expected. Look, the situation in Kashmir is a total tragedy because the way the India has handled it under Congress and non-Congress governments has not been good. For a democracy to have a a part of the country that is essentially under almost continuous martial, martial law with an almost continuous suspension of dem democracy and democratic rights is a terrible situation. On the other hand, when you have a Pakistan that has been fueling militancy and insurgency and violence and terrorism for decades and decades, it is, uh, it is an understandable uh, reaction. I, I don't want to, you know, I really do think it's important to remember it's not a good place we are. But I think many countries, many democracies, and they're facing a similar situation, might react in a similar way or somewhat similar way. So I, I, I think that there has to be a broader solution to Kashmir. There, it has to involve somehow getting the Pakistani government to realize that there is no future in constantly you know, trying to keep India off guard, strategic depth, whatever you want to call it, this you know, asymmetrical warfare. That, if you could do that and if you could simultaneously uh, make the promise that Kashmir would be, would be given back its democratic uh, rights, you know, that's a kind of win-win that theoretically makes sense. Uh, unfortunately, it seems we're very far from that right Imran now.